this is the beginning of the day, the beginning of our monastic day, the beginning of a retreat. We make this fully conscious beginning. Sometimes we just slip through life, never noticing anything, just going through motions and only the kind of uh, extreme, extreme peaks or depressions of life we ever really, ever really become conscious in our mind. And most of our life is just a shadow of, of just going through the motions in a perfunctory, passive way. Then you can come up here to the shrine room, sit down, be completely oblivious to anything that happens, and stay caught in your own feelings, mood of the moment, without reflecting, without recognizing the most obvious, what's nearest and what's close, what is obvious, we, we don't, sometimes we pay no attention to. Meditation, we are reflecting on that this is the beginning of the day. It's the end of it, we reflect on the end of it, in the middle, it's the middle of it. Reflecting on this, the beginning of a retreat, meditation retreat, which is another perception of the mind, isn't it? What does a retreat mean? What do you expect? What the, having that perception now, what is what does that do to the mind? The beginning of a retreat, and what do you? What is your reaction to going on retreat? Make all kinds of plans to do this or that, or attainments. So maybe you're dreading it, fearing it, or expecting that you can observe. The beginning of a retreat. Just as we note the end of it of a what we call a retreat, a span of time designated for a certain way of doing something. When you get up in the morning, you note know, that when the bell rings at four o'clock, to a vow in your mind to get up, Immediately, rather than just laying there thinking about getting up. Train the, the body to move like that is skillful. It's conditioning, but otherwise the mental conditions of we become just passive, uh, to, putting off things, procrastinating, laying in bed because we don't feel like getting up. Because getting up takes effort, doesn't it? When you wake up, you don't have a lot of energy, a lot of effort going. To, it's easier just to lay passively in a warm bed than to put forth the effort in getting up. And in our practice now, you need to put forth that kind of effort of getting up, of doing something, rather than just passively slipping into, a, into, into that, what's easiest, what's most comfortable. So during this retreat, vow in your mind to, to, even before the bell rings, if you can set your mind to get up uh, five minutes before the bell rings at four o'clock in the morning. Good training. Or get up at three o'clock in the morning. If you can get up at three o'clock in the morning, rather than just being one who waits for everything to just happen and then you just follow it. If you can train yourself to, to move around the schedule rather than just be can, uh, help a uh, kind of a conditioned creature of the schedule. Use the schedule as a, as a skillful means, a kind of reflection and a guide rather than just uh, <coughs> being a slave to it. It's easier to, to, to sleep or stay in bed five minutes after the bell more than to put forth the effort of arising five minutes before the bell, doesn't it? Or do you take what's easiest? Do you do what is the easiest thing to do? It takes the least amount of effort. Because effort is uh, what? It, not all that pleasant enough to exert effort in situation. Especially when you're feeling passive or comfortable or 
just waking up. And one habit is to just drift, fall, indulge into that passive state of the easiest, most comfortable thing to do. But as some of us know, you're training. It's a training process. It's very important to train, like the way to practice. Otherwise, your life, as you get older, you'll just sink into senility and passivity and fear. And as you can see, many people that come here whose minds, when they get older, just are, there's, no, there's no, nothing much they can do because they have not developed, practiced while they're young. So they just sink into depression and fear and wrong views because that's the easiest thing to do. It takes effort not to be caught in a mood, doesn't it? Caught up in, 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 the, in the easiest thing, you just follow every mood that comes into your mind. <clears throat> that doesn't take any effort, does it? Just, just whatever you feel like, you do that. When you feel guilty, then you do the things you're supposed to do out of guilt and fear, not out of real effort. Or you do things because you think, I'm going to get on your back if you don't, or one of the monks is going to chastise you for not doing it. Or you'll be looked down on by other people. Those kind of things motivate us. But that's the kind of actions we do out of just stupidity, isn't it? When we don't really put the effort, the clear, bright effort into what we're doing. We just depend on getting things done out of fear, habit, worrying about what others will think of us or what uh, somebody will criticize if we don't do it. And that's the kind of, we go through life just passively doing things out of, out of just fear or guilt. And the result, notice the result of people's lives who've lived on that level is not very admirable, not very beautiful to see. <clears throat> and this life is not military camp, as I've stated before, so it's not, we're not going to go around uh, beating you or, or saying anything, really, if you, you can... You know, if you want to just follow each mood, if you're determined to, to be miserable and not be enlightened, then that, that's your decision in this life. But the encouragement and the movement is toward realization, toward enlightenment. And if you have no in, interest in that, then it's best not to be here, better to go somewhere else. Because it's a waste of our time, the communities, the alms offered, if you're not serious and sincere in the intention towards realization, towards enlightenment. If that's not your sincere intention, then best to leave. Go someplace where uh, what you want to do is you can do it with people like yourself. And coming together here in this meditation hall through the morning chanting. How much effort do you put into the chanting? Is it take effort, doesn't it? Concentrate the mind to do the chanting properly. One can just do it like a like one of these parrots and uh, just go through the motion. But this also is something to put effort into and make bright in the mind. Offering for the day, reflection for the day, candles, incense, flowers. Offering from your mind, really. Putting forth out, sending out that which is wise truthful, 
vowing to live in a virtuous way today, a considerate, kindly way. Then we reflect on the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. There are always important reflections for our life. The Buddha, the awakened one, that which is awake, that which is alert, that which knows. Gautama the Buddha, the sage who, who uh, established this traditional form that we're using now. Click on that. This is, this we're using the form, the Dhamma teaching of a of a of a tradition established by Gautama the Buddha in India 2,527 years ago. This is the teaching, this is the tool that we're using. Not believing in, not we believe in what Gotama the Buddha taught, but we're using it. For, how are we using it? By reflecting on it. Using it to observe the way things are. Like right now, the way it is right now, you, this ability to reflect on the way it is right now as you, as it's uh, in your consciousness. <coughs> so that's taking refuge in Buddha, in the awakened, in that which is awake. Buddha is not a personal possession. You say, my Buddha is in contrast to yours. So, not one person has more Buddha than the other. But our refuge is in, in the Buddha, in wisdom, in being awake. This is what we can all be, rather than become. In our practice now, it's the practice of being awake, alert to the way things are. <coughs> Reflecting on them, on the, the Dhamma, the truth, the way it is, how all that arises passes away, how that all everything that is born dies. This is the way the whole sensual experience is, if you observe it, you're observing this. Notice that this is not a, a judgment, you're not saying arising is this is good, or this is beautiful, or perfect. This is just the way it is, isn't it? If you observe, if you're, if you're one who really watches and reflects on things, you see that any mental condition or physical one arises and passes, begins and ends. So you're contemplating Dharma, you're reflecting on the way it is, rather than the way you believe, or the way you, you think, you, you wish it were, or would like things to be. Wouldn't it be nice if, if everybody were good and all everybody were kind and there was no cruelty and, uh, and there was no death and there's no sickness? Wouldn't it be nice if everybody could get along and help each other and love each other? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we never had to get old and, and always stay beautiful and attractive? And wouldn't it be wonderful if there were no wars? Only if all the lions and lambs would, would be friends, wouldn't it be sweet? Wouldn't it be wonderful if everything were the way I would like it to be so I wouldn't have to be frightened or upset by life? Wouldn't it be wonderful if life was, were, could take the form of my fantasies where I could feel safe and secure and protected? And only good and pretty and nice things would ever happen to me. And I'd never have to experience any of the pain or misery or sorrow or anguish of existence. If I could just stay away from that forever. And all of us here, all beings, live happily forevermore in the state of permanent bliss. Wouldn't that be lovely? That's what a lot of people, they may not say that in uh, in so many words, but that's 
the way many people really operate in life. Wouldn't it be nice if everything were nice? <laughs> Profound. <laughs> we should all love each other. This is true, it would be nice if, if everything was nice. There's no question of that. And it would be good if everybody loved each other. And if there was no war, and lambs and lions could be friends. I'm not, I'm not uh, being cynical. I'm just pointing out a kind of assumptions and wishes are that way. But how are things? What is the way things really operate in life, in the sensory world? What is the nature of the sensory world? What is it to oneself? And what, what do we have to learn from it? What do we have to learn from the pain of our existence and the sorrow and anguish of it, as well as from the beauty and the goodness of it? This is a wise reflection, not just wishful thinking and pretty thoughts. This is the Buddha, that which is awake, observing the way things are, observing, knowing the Dhamma, that what arises passes. At birth, conditions death. So why does somebody have to die? Why does why did some somebody have to die? A little child. Why did Hannah have to die so young? Why do people have to have cancer? Why do why do these terrible things go on? Because of birth, all of us are subject to instant immediate pain or sorrow or despair because of having been born. <clears throat> Everything that we love and hold on and uh, feel secure with can be taken away from us immediately. You recognize that. Is it that the ever present possibility for any one of us that everything we are very attached to and depend on could be just snatched away from us in the next moment. That's a possibility, that's not being pessimistic or negative, but recognize that that, that is very, uh, that's a possibility for all of us. So that our lives as human beings, as sens sensual beings, is a very insecure one, and its nature is, is that way. It's insecure, it's dukkha, it's not, it's not a, a safe place to identified to to seek security with it because its nature is insecure anyway. So that this way of reflecting is a way of a Buddha observing the way things are, that what arises passes. Birth takes you to death. When you're born into a sensory earthbound body such as this one, you have must learn to endure and experience old age, sickness, the your senses, sensory, your eye, vision, ears and all that deteriorating as you get older, body stiffening, the beauty uh, of youth going away, and the and then the ossifying old age, <coughs> and then the death as from having been born. It's like it's winter time now. So it's, if there were no spring, there wouldn't be any winter. Spring, summer, autumn, winter, and then spring again, the cycle. Now what we're moving to is deathless. The Nibbana, realization of deathlessness, rather than trying to crop up pleasant conditions for a lifetime. Pleasant mortal conditions. We're not here to try to create a beautiful environment to kind of contain us and depend on it for a lifetime, but to use 
the conditions around us for this kind of reflection. So we're not here to try to live a happy life as a community in a kind of fool's paradise. We create a pretty lifestyle where we can laugh and sing and pretend everything is is pretty and nice. But using the conditions around us for reflection, observing, that even on, on the best times here, the sunny summer days in the beautiful uh, part of England, where people are, the kind of people we live with are pretty high quality, everything is quite pleasant, and yet we can still be utterly miserable. I've seen some of you on some of the most fortunate kind of beautiful days I've ever experienced look absolutely wretched. Not because of anything wrong, but because of your doubts or anger or worries, the things you produce out of your mind towards yourself or others. Is it something wrong? Is, are we doing something? No. It's just the misery you create around the existing condition. You project that out. If you reflect, rather than just do that, you begin to see what you're doing, how we create the misery for ourselves. Even when life is very pleasant, very good to us, and we're very fortunate. Not to mention when life can be very unpleasant sometimes. Sometimes it's cold and damp and, and unpleasant things happen. Sicknesses. Disappointments and all this. And mis life can be pretty miserable. And then we create. We indulge in, we become lost in depression because we don't like that. We want it to be pleasant again. But even when life is pleasant, we create misery. When it's unpleasant, we create misery. But we're looking at that which we create around the existing condition. To know that, you have to be really wisely look at the way things are. Like right now, at this moment, when you're sitting here in this shrine room, what is it? Is anything that is anything really terribly wrong? It's not terribly pleasant temperature, at least for me. Not too hot, too cold. Nothing. There's no kind of like wild tigers lurking around, waiting to. There's no kind of communist guerrillas taking shots at us. There's no immediate threat, nothing to really do, except be here. So then you have a way of looking at the, what, what is truly miserable, what, what might be miserable, like if there was, if it was too cold or, or you're feeling really ill or sick or this, then you, you can recognize that and begin to reflect on, on that, on the feelings of being cold or not feeling well or feeling sleepy or dull. these morning chants, reflection, this bringing forth this ability, using this ability to observe, reflect on the way things are. <clears throat> the Sangha now is the Sangha, refuge in Sangha, the one who practices, who does it, Supatipano a sincere kind of being who's actually practicing it, not just talking about it or believing in it, but actually does it. 
practices the teaching of Buddha and what I've been describing actually awakening, watching, being alert to the way things are with the misery of the moment to really observe it and reflect off it rather than just eradicate it or endowed in it. And the Ujjupatipano is the straight one who directs. It's not, this is not a roundabout teaching, a very direct kind of teaching. It's not you develop this to get there and then when you get to this stage, then you go on to the next stage, and then you have to develop this one first, and then that, and onward, and and uh, maybe the next lifetime, if you're very fortunate, or maybe maybe you're so hopeless that the next ten lifetimes, you just have to develop patient endurance. Or maybe you, some of you, I hear are aiming for Brahma realms because you might not make Nibbana in this lifetime. Don't be stupid. I'm, I think I'll just try to get jhanas and go and become born in the Brahma realms because I'm I'm not really don't think I can make it to Nibbana. I think Buddha was teaching that. You're not a Buddhist really if that's what you're if, your, if that's your intention for this life. You don't understand. And maybe the next lifetime I'll be born in a you know, I'll have more bar of me and be born a little better so then I can really practice. Don't believe that. That's, that's just uh, uh, ignorance from your own mind when you're creating that kind of vision. The bond is to be realized here and now. It's not next lifetime. If, if you believe that Nibbana, you have to wait for the next lifetime, then you, you don't really understand anything the Buddha taught. hopeless case. But when you think that the Nibbana, the, the, the goal of a Buddhist, is a realization of deathlessness now, is not even next tomorrow, not even the next moment, now, is, is an immediate one, it's Ujju Patipano, straight, direct. <clears throat> If you notice, the Buddha never really praised anyone for being reborn in the Brahma realms, or going to the heavenly realms, or seeking all that. And put it down as not very clever of anyone to, to put that as the goal for one's life. Our goal is Nibbana, so whether you real, whether you, uh, whatever you think of that, you can observe, but make that your clear intention, the realization of truth, realization of deathlessness, now. Not to believe in it, but to, as you begin to free the mind from its obsessions with mortal conditions, and then you realize that. Know it. Know the bliss of non-attachment. <clears throat> 